and across the fence, it's our perennial program on perennials. We'll see some old favorites, a few new selections, and learn the difference between peppermint twist and caramel. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. With the perennial flower season at its peak, choosing which flowers and grasses to plant among the thousands available can be a little overwhelming. With us today to give us a few tips on some of the best perennials for our northern climate is Leonard Perry, University of Vermont Extension Horticulturalist. Well, welcome back. Yeah, it's always fun to be here, Judy. So how do you choose your favorites and do you even have favorites? Well, the favorites, the people often ask me that and it's usually what's in bloom at the time and looks good <laughs> and it's, it's survived and that's one of the things, of course, we're interested in in the North Country is what's going to survive winters and this last winter is a great example um, and I do my trials in the Champlain Valley in a zone 4 which is typical of much of Vermont um, even but last year it's interesting because even though it's a little bit warmer air temperatures it was the soil temperatures that were much colder because uh, a lot of times when it was cold, I didn't have any snow or very little snow, and oh. that, that ground really just got really cold, and that, so uh, lost a, quite a few things. And so what does the, the term zone mean, because it's zone, what are we, zone four? Yeah, zone four, uh, zone five uh, near the lake, this basically refers to the average annual minimum winter temperature. In other words, how cold it gets on average in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. And basically zone four is minus 20 to minus 30, zone five is warmer as the numbers get higher, that it gets warmer, uh, minus 10 to minus 20. And actually this last year I was on the map, and air temperature, and which is important for the woody plants, zone five, okay? And so basically um, brought a couple of pictures, one of my trials, okay. um, <clears throat> take a look at, and here is just one of the several beds uh, with deer fencing around, have quite a few deer, but you know, we usually trial about 100, 200 different new uh, perennials a year plus, and we'll talk about these later, some cone flowers, I've got about 60 of those, and about 90 different coral bells. So uh, a lot of trials going on on different things, but here is that map, uh, you can go to the uh, USDA website there, or just on a search engine uh, type in hardiness zone map and come up with the USDA map and there's Vermont you can click on the map come up with Vermont and you can see the uh, lighter colors kind of on the west that's uh, warmer and colder kind of the purplish and up in the Northeast Kingdom down to southern kind of corners of the state a little bit warmer down there too maybe zone 5 but um, that was again just an average and as you know averages um, will vary. Mm -hmm. Well tell me a little bit about that too because it's not really a one-size-fits-all Exactly, and it's not, you know, that's not the last word on it by any means because any one property may have several uh, zones mm -hmm. uh, because of microclimates. Now, these are the climates due to a fact like on the southern side of a building might be a lot warmer. That might be a zone five in my case. Um, a north facing slope, in my case, might be a zone three, which is actually colder because it doesn't really get any sunshine. So you can have these microclimates. If you don't have a plant survive, I always say give it at least three tries, three strikes before they're out. Mm -hmm. Here's a baseball analogy. Um, and try it in a different site, you know, and, and it may oh, like idea. the soil better, it may like uh, the sun better. And that's mm -hmm. the other thing, in addition to the temperature, it's the sunlight. I brought some pictures there, and we'll talk about three groupings, shade, part shade, and sun. And here's the first one, a Japanese painted fern, a great one for the shade. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these part sh uh, shade plants, we'll take some part shade too, but it really brightens up with that silvery foliage. You see a hosta on the left. Now, I didn't bring pictures of some of the big groups, like hostas, that is probably the most popular perennial big leaf foliage plants there's just so many of those I brought some more unusual ones like the fern but you see the contrast with the foliage with the hosta goes really nice now this one the lady in red is a lady fern and this was actually developed at uh, New England wildflower and you can see in the fall on the left those red stems just gorgeous but that's another good fern for the shade for a fine texture this is one uh, that was a selection from the usual uh, bugloss Siberian bugloss which has just kind of greenish leaves but this has silvery leaves. Again, very, brightens up that shade. Little flowers you can hardly see, kind of like a forget-me-not, which is really nice, um, too, in the, in the springtime, but that little silvery foliage. And there are different versions of that, too, different other cultivars. Now, this Carex, or sedge, looks kind of like a grass, it's actually a sedge, is a great plant because it does well in shade, part shade, and you can see the little sun logo. It mm -hmm. actually grows well, as I have it here in sun. So it's one of those plants you can put most any place, uh, but there's quite a few different, these sedges, some with blue leaves, some with golden like that. 
Then another one of my favorites is the uh, variegated Solomon seal. You see the little white flowers that hang down from the stems there in early, uh, late spring, early summer. Plant gets about two feet high, has these arching stems, and the variegated one has this white margin around it, so it's very nice. And you see some lungworts underneath with the white spotted leaves. So, uh, but that's a very good uh, hardy plant and, and does real well. All these are again hardy in, in my site, uh, zone four, so it'll be hardy in much of Vermont. Now uh, the foam flowers. Are they're a great ground cover. They're a native plant. A lot of times oh, people no want to have native plants. Uh, there's been a lot of selection of these, such as this one, lace carpet, with very pretty flowers and very lacy leaves. A lot of leaf variation in these foam flowers that bloom in early summer, you know, and early in June. Pink bouquet is just loaded with flowers. And some of these foam flowers, I would say uh, maybe about half or three quarters are um, clump formers like this. And then the others are spreaders. And there's a series called the River Series. Uh, appropriate since they spread from a grower that's a former and breeder, former grad student of mine, and a uh, local grower now, Sinclair Adam. You see two of these uh, he bred when he was in Pennsylvania. They're named after rivers here, Lehigh, Susquehanna, uh, and some other names like that. So a great plant for a ground cover for shade and a native plant. And now people shouldn't panic because we're going to have all the information to getting uh, these kinds exactly. of plants. Exactly. We, we have a program. list online at the end and my website <laughs> and, and more on all these topics. Okay, so next we have partial shade. Part shade, right. Shade is either no direct sun or under four hours direct, uh, direct okay. sun a day. Now, part shade is a little bit more sun. In other words, four to six hours of direct sun a day. Uh, most of these plants will take a look at for part shade that um, tolerate part shade. Actually, some of them may prefer full sun or do well in full sun, such as ladies mantle, you often see that growing in full sun. A great, uh, nice plant, a low one, uh, good long walks here. The nice thing about that, and the kind of chartreuse uh, flowers to it, is when it rains, uh, water beads up in little drops on the leaves, and it's just gorgeous. So ladies mantle, again, does well in full sun, as does this one, the blue stars. Um, there's one of these, Ozark blue stars, it's a perennial plant of the year, but kind of fine foliage, it, and this is what I call an instant shrub, gets up maybe two feet or, or more tall depending on the uh, species or cultivar mm -hmm. and makes a shrub um, but dies back in the winter. All these perennials you know die back to the ground in winter uh, but covered in early summer with these uh, clusters of uh, blue uh, star-like flowers hence the name blue stars. Now this is a bleeding heart variation. A lot of people know the old-fashioned bleeding right. heart gets two or three feet high and across but this is gold foliage. It's called uh, gold heart. <clears throat> it was a grower actually in England found this and propagated it and you can find this as you can most of these somewhat readily now, especially from specialty growers, and I've got a list on my website of some of those in Vermont. But you can see the typical, you know, in late spring flowers that hang down, but gold foliage, again, great for part shade to brighten it up. There's a whole host of these barren warts, epimediums, that get about a foot high, uh, spread to nice clumps, maybe a two foot across, but not aggressive, have these nice flowers in late spring. And there's some with rose flowers and different leaf patterns, but really, once they're established, these will take, um, you know, they'll take uh, quite a bit of drought. So that's a, that's a good plant uh, in many ways, a very durable plant. Now, there's lots of perennial geraniums. There's some that bloom in spring, a lot in bloom in summer. Here just shows you some of the variety, and that's about six or seven inches across. And so you see from maybe about inch to uh, four or five inches across, some of those leaves, and then the flower, um, and you see some of the leaf patterns on that. So a lot of different leaf patterns in the perennial geraniums. And again, these are perennial. These are not the annual ones. Mm -hmm. um, and you see some of the flower colors. In late May, I had a, one time a collection, and these were, I just went around into May and collected flowers so you could see all in bloom at once, the kind of flower uh, variation you can have. This is one called Ann Thompson. Now, I should mention Ann is not as hardy as some of the other geraniums, maybe a zone five, so colder places might not um, grow this but you can see it kind of weaving up amongst other plants. Uh, so it's a good plant for that. Uh, this one is called Midnight Rider. There's a set, two or three. There's one called Espresso. It's uh, dark leaves, you know, mm -hmm. very dark and with the flowers against it. And a lot of these geraniums uh, like this make nice clumps about a foot or so high and a couple of cross, feet across, something like that. So, and then moving on to Gila You have to watch some of these because some aren't as hardy as others. So you want to make sure you watch that hardiness zone when you're um, choosing these or put them in a protected place. But this is one that's actually came out of England. It's one of the more choice ones. 
ponds for several reasons. One, it's very hardy. I've had it for many years. Uh, at our horticulture center, when I put some of those in, um, the plants got up to where I gave up counting. There's maybe 200 flowers oh, no on kidding. a plant, and they're upward facing, which a lot of these aren't. But often called Lenten rose, uh, that's because they bloom uh, in early spring. So. Oh, that's just one um, with the helibores, and then there's a whole host of the coral bells. And I brought some pictures of one of my favorites. Been around a while, petite pearl fairy, about 15 inches high and a foot or so across, but loaded with flowers. Um, it's not one of the new fancy leafed ones, but it's a real good one, a nice miniature one. And then we have a silver load, which is a somewhat new one from the Blooms of Bressingham program, which is a program I trial some plants for. One of the few, there are a few trial sites in the country. Silvery leaves, very strong stems, make good cut flowers, just does better than most any other. So it's a great coral bells. Um, the dark secret, um, there's several of the dark uh, leafed ones that are just uh, great. And again, at the end, we'll give my website, and I've got a whole list of the results on those. But dark secret is one that's been very vigorous and done well. Unlike some of the light colored, you see a lot of these fancy leafed light colored ones, they haven't done as well, not nearly as vigorous such as lime ricky. But I wanted to show a few uh, just to, so you could see the variation. Amber waves, this is a pretty one because it has kind of that reddish, so several of these new coral bells have the reddish underneath um, and that's very nice effect in caramel uh, is a real popular one. That's, that's been fairly good. It's not one of the best, but it's very popular one. It adds a real nice orangey color. And it's actually a species called Velosa, as you see there, which that's a type of hairiness. So the leaves are very soft, fuzzy, which is kind of neat. And there's several of those. And actually, it's interesting because I've tried some of those. They've been bred in France, but they're actually quite hardy here, so it's interesting. Um, stoplight is an interesting one because we saw the foam flower first, mm -hmm. the Tiarella, and we just seen the coral bells, the Heuchera. Well, this is a cross, hence Heucherella. It's a uh, bigeneric cross, and that's very unusual. You don't usually see two genera cross like that. So there's quite a few of those. They look basically like coral bells. I find they're not quite as hardy um, as them, but, uh, but this is a very popular one called Stoplight. See, with the kind of yellowish leaves with the uh, red uh, veination in it. So just a few of the coral bells that have done well and, and just some of the new varieties. Plume poppy does well in sun, too. Uh, you see it here against a nice brick wall. This is one that can get quite large, maybe six to eight feet, and can spread a bit. So you really have to site it properly. But you know, in this case, I mow in front of it. There's a wall behind it. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> the birds love it. it. It's great to see that light through it. Um, so the plume poppy is one to consider. Uh, this comfrey is different. This is not the type that just spreads rampantly all over like the usual comfrey. This is called Russian comfrey. It's a variegated form. Looks beautiful early summer with these uh, the flowers and you see the variegated leaves and just makes a clump like that. It's very hardy. Does well in pretty much sun too or part shade, which is what we're still looking at. Um, so Russian comfrey is just a, a great one, specimen plant. Um, as is, and this is a nice one, it's in bloom midsummer, uh, and you can see that does well in full sun too, but we'll take some shade. It's called Culver's Root, uh, Veronicastrum. Uh, this is a, a cultivar or cultivated variety called Lavender Towers. The thing I like about this is to go out when that's in bloom, and you just see it covered with bees and pollinators. It's a great plant for those. So do most perennials as a rule of thumb, really prefer sun? A lot of them do prefer, and I think that's a key word you don't see usually in books or catalogs, but they usually prefer, but um, again, a lot will tolerate part shade and do fairly well. If a plant's not growing too well, if it's getting tall, if it's not blooming, then it may need more sun. That's a good key. It, it might be getting too much shade. And it's okay to, to dig them up the next year and move them around? It and is, see. and spring is probably the good time for most of those to dig them up. But we did bring just a few for the sun, um, just to show a new series of yarrow that just blooms most of the season, unlike a lot of perennials, so the Tutti Fruity series, so a lot of uh, fruity names. So that's a great series of yarrow, doesn't really get aggressive and spread. There are a lot of new of these Baptisia or false indigos. You see there's a real pretty yellow one, but you see these prairie blues and purple smoke. Uh, the prairie series was developed in Chicago at the Botanic Garden uh, bred. So some of these Baptisias, they make nice, they're again a shrubby kind of plant, dies to the ground but gets a beautiful plant early in the season, <clears throat> kind of like a shrub. Um, here you see some cone flowers being bred out in Chicago, some of the variety in their breeding trials. 
And then just a few different examples. So one of my favorites, Tiki Torch, you see the mm -hmm. coconut lime and, and green envy with the green on it. Um, one of those perennial geraniums that blooms right through the last half of the summer, Roseanne. It was a perennial plant of the year. That's just a great plant, very hardy. Uh, Anugium, one of my favorite. It's one of the best. It's uh, orange flowers, Tim's tangerine. Here's that peppermint twist, uh, phlox. It just shows you some of the variety in the new garden phlox. And then, um, of course, got to mention the grasses. I've got an ornamental grass trial of uh, panicum, the switch grass, and here just a couple of varieties of that. And again, more on my website on all these trials, and including these grasses too. And of course, that's peren Perry's Perennial Pages. Yeah, Perry's Perennials.info. And again, there's just a lot of uh, between nurseries, the plant lists, plants of the month, um, just a lot more on perennials. Well, thank you so much for bringing in those pictures. It always gets me out in the garden. <laughs> that's it for our program today. I'll see you next time on Across the Fence. For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.